Hi, I'm Walt, this is Delta Astrophotography, and in this video, we're gonna be talking about the Tamron 150 to 600 millimeter G2 lens, also known as the Tamzuka. <laughs> so, you've gotten yourself a star tracker and you wanna dip your toe in the waters of deep sky astrophotography. You've got the 75 to 300 millimeter kit lens, but you're wanting a little upgrade, maybe a telescope or maybe something with more reach. And after digging around on the internet, you discover the Tamron 150 to 600 millimeter G2 lens. You do a little research on it, only to find people on cloudy night forums and other astronomy forums like this. Why would anyone ever spend that much money on a zoom lens when for a fraction of the price you could get an apochromatic telescope with far superior optics? And although they may be right about the superior optics, I think the gear snobs and the purists are just kind of missing the point of this lens. It's just such a versatile tool and it's great to cut your teeth on in deep sky astrophotography. And where else are you going to find a 600 millimeter telescope that sits on top of a small star tracker? They're just way too heavy. I think this fits the bill. The Tamzuka is definitely a step up from your kit lenses in both quality and features. I'll get to the quality in a few minutes. This lens features autofocus, and three levels of image stabilization. And let me just say, if you're trying to take handheld pictures with this in the daylight, you're gonna need it. It's almost impossible without it. One feature I absolutely love about this lens is when you zoom in to the focal length you want, you just pull this piece out right here and it locks it in place. It doesn't go anywhere. You don't have to worry about it slipping during the night and you no longer have to worry about taping your focal length down. Duct tape. Nope, not even a little bit, gone. Another great feature of this lens is this awesome tripod collar. The long foot on the tripod collar here makes it extremely easy to mount to the included dovetail plate of the iOption Skyguider Pro. And there you have it. It also has a rotator, so I can rotate my camera to change the field of view. The two holes on the bottom here make it easy for you to mount to the Skywatcher Star Adventure just by mounting it directly on top, but I do not recommend that method because you cannot balance declination. Instead, I recommend using the two screw holes on the bottom of the tripod collar to attach a Vixen style dovetail and then getting a dovetail clamp for your Skywatcher Star Adventure. That way you can mount it just like this. And when you're balancing your declination, you are able to move it back and forth like this. If you don't know what I'm talking about, this lens is very heavy and it needs to be balanced in right ascension and declination. This is not enough. It's not fully balanced yet, because I can take it, I can point it over here and let go. And as you see, it's falling backwards. That's not balanced. I would need to then take it, push it up in the saddle a little bit. And you see when I let go, it doesn't go anywhere. That's proper balance. And that's why it's very cool that you can attach dovetails to this lens. But how does this lens actually perform? We're gonna be looking at three things to judge its performance. One, chromatic aberration, otherwise known as color fringing. It's kind of what happens when your red and your blue don't really focus at the same time and you get like this reddish or purple halo around the stars. The next is chromatic aberration or coma. And you'll see it on the edges of your photos when the stars start to stretch out, elongate, or have like comet tails. And finally, there's vignetting. So we're going to jump on the computer, and first I'm going to show you a picture taken with the 75 to 300 millimeter kit lens, so you can see exactly what those look like. And then we'll look at a photo with the 150 to 600 millimeter lens. And so the first thing we notice with this photo taken with a cheap lens is our stars all have these blobs, these reddish and purple blobs around them. That is color fringing or chromatic aberration. Now we're gonna move down into the corner of the photo and we can see the stars are starting to stretch, elongate a little bit. That's coma. Now let's quickly look at another photo with a different lens. There's a Milky Way shot. We'll zoom in a little bit. See the stars are fairly normal looking. When we go over to the corner, we have very stretched out stars. That's some pretty bad coma. This is the Tamron 24 to 70 lens. Let's go back to this Andromeda for a second and let's do a major curve stretch just to look at the vignetting. As we can see here, it's pretty severe in the corners. Very dark. I don't know what was going on up here. Maybe some light pollution or something, but yeah, we got some very dark 
vignetting in the corners. Now we're gonna hop over to a stacked but unprocessed photo that I took with the 150 to 600 with a full frame camera so you could see any problems that might be in the corners. Here we go. For those of you who love stargazing, you probably might already recognize this little star cluster as the Pleiades. Now the first thing we notice is the stars do not have any color fringing. They're pretty round. Let's move down into a corner. Here we can just barely start to see some coma developing, but it's nowhere near as severe as it was in the other lenses. All in all, I would say that this picture turned out fairly well. Now to test the vignetting, we're gonna look at this same photo, but a single subframe, a raw file. No stacking, no flats, nothing like that. So here's our raw file. We're gonna do another curve stretch. A very extreme one that I normally wasn't, wouldn't do. And check that out. The vignetting is not nearly as bad. I can see a little bit of darkening in the corners, but it's not severe. And it's something that can be easily fixed with a simple gradient exterminator. Bam, we have vignetting free images. All right, so my take is that this lens actually outperforms all my other lenses. It does not outperform my telescope. The stars are definitely a lot more sharp and even more round with the telescope, but this lens is very close. And the lack of vignetting is really nice. You could get away with taking a night's worth of images without having to do flats. So now let's talk about the pros and cons of this lens. So let's go ahead and get the cons out of the way. The first thing, the thing that drives me the most crazy about this lens is focusing. It is extremely hard to focus. One small microscopic turn is the difference between out of focus, in focus, or out of focus the other way. I have spent so many nights thinking my lens was just trash because everything looked so muddy and terrible, only to find out that, no, I was just out of focus. It just takes a lot of time and practice to get to really learn how to focus with this lens. Con number two, the stars just aren't always perfectly round. I've, I've had a hard time getting them absolutely perfect like my telescope. Now I said earlier, it didn't really have bad chromatic aberration, but it's, it's there slightly. And if you go a little bit out of focus, you can really tell. But that's really a con for the pixel peepers. You know, if somebody's just looking at it on their phone, not trying to zoom way in, it's not really that noticeable. So it's not too bad of a con. Con number three is speed. This is not a very fast lens compared to a lot of smaller telescopes. Zoomed in at 600 millimeters, you're looking at f6.3, but then you still wanna stop it down just so you can get sharper stars. Maybe stop it down to f7.1 or even f8. You're not letting in a whole lot of light there, so it's not necessarily the best for astrophotography right there. And finally, the last con is more about the focal length of 600 millimeters than the lens itself. When you're shooting at 600 millimeters, you are really gonna have to master your polar alignment and your balancing in both right ascension and declination. They're extremely important, and even so, you're still gonna be lucky to get 30 to 60 seconds without star trails. You're probably gonna end up wanting to invest in an auto guider, a guide cam and a, a guide scope, and a laptop or an ASI Air to connect those two. So you're probably gonna to wanna to spend some more money. So that's something you really wanna keep in mind. But after you've mastered all that, when you graduate to using telescopes and go-to mounts and things like that, it's gonna be a breeze. So I think the extra work is really worth it. Now we can talk about the pros. The first of which is obvious, the huge range of focal length, anywhere from 150, which is really wide for deep sky astrophotography, to 600 millimeters, which is starting to get kind of deep. It's February right now, and there are so many wonderful things in the sky to photograph. There's the almost angelic Orion Nebula. There's the beautiful rosette. Far away, distant galaxies. There's also a horse surrounded by flames, a witch and the entire state of California. Seriously, if I wanted to, I could take this lens out one night into a field and I could spend a few hours at 150 millimeters photographing Ro Ophiuchi. After I'm done with that, I can zoom into five or 600 millimeters and point it over at the Lagoon Nebula and get a few hours on that. I never have to change lenses. I just might have to rebalance and refocus. That right there is worth it to me. Pro number two, the weight. As I mentioned earlier, 
It's hard to find a 600 millimeter telescope that you're gonna be able to get on top of a star tracker. The weight of this lens is a little under five pounds or just a little over two kilograms. That's about half the weight of a telescope that's around 600 millimeters. And for things like Milky Way, which is in kind of the southeast or southern skies, southwest in that area, I can't photograph that stuff in my yard and I'm not gonna bring a big go-to mount out into a field until I get a battery pack. So I'm gonna be putting this thing on a star tracker and carrying it all around the fields out there. And that light weight is perfect for what I need. Pro number three is that it's so easy to mount. A lot of camera lenses, you cannot get them onto like, let's say a go-to mount or onto a star tracker without using a ball head or something. And I'm sorry, I, I do not like putting cameras onto a ball head or directly onto a mount because then I cannot balance the declination axis. That's just a no-go for me. I like it how it, you can attach the dovetail and easily put it on a go-to mount or a star tracker with a dovetail clamp. It's almost like it was made to go on one of those. And finally, the last pro for this lens is that it has autofocus and image stabilization, so you can use it for more than just astrophotography. It's a great daytime bird and wildlife photography lens. So that's my short pros and cons list. Now let me just give you a couple of tips on how to get the best results out of this lens with astrophotography. Tip number one, get rid of the lens hood. This thing is nothing more than a big wind catcher and it's gonna cause problems down the road. Tip number two, get a batten off mask. This will solve all your focusing problems. The filter thread for this lens is 95 millimeters and you can get on eBay and find a 95 millimeter Batonov mask for less than $15. It just kind of clips right on the front. You take maybe a three to five second long exposure on a really bright star and then you look for the diffraction spike patterns. Uh, it looks like an X with a straight line through it. You keep taking the test shots and adjusting your focus until you get that diffraction spike pattern and then you are good to go. And the final tip is something I've said already, but it's extremely important and it's learn to balance really well in right ascension and declination. It's gonna save you many nights where you're throwing your files away because they all have star trails. Balancing is key and so is really good polar alignment. And I guess that's about all I have to say about that lens. If you're thinking about getting one or if you already have one, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked the video, please give me a like and a subscribe because there'll be lots more stuff coming like this. For now, I'm just gonna leave you with a few of my favorite images taken with this lens. So as always, everybody, stay spacey, clear skies, and good night.